Well, fingers crossed that dining in at restaurants will be allowed again when Monday rolls around. And that got us wondering how COVID-19 restrictions affect private dining businesses where customers go to the chef's home for a meal. Well, here to shed some light on this is ST's food editor, Tan Xie Yuan. Welcome back to the show, Xie. So let's use a place that you recently reviewed as a, a, a case study of sorts, Pan Im, which serves refined Thai food at owner Vincent Pang's house. How has he managed to pivot his private dining business during the latest round of measures? And, you know, is it easier for smaller businesses like Panim to come up with alternatives during this difficult period of time? Well, it kind of really depends on the kind of food that you serve. So, um, Panim does uh, it, like a lot of other private dining businesses have had to do um, to offer takeout food or um, delivery food to be delivered to people's homes because they simply can't um, host uh, people in, in their own uh, home, right? And the thing with Pan Im is that the food is super refined. It's a similar experience to eating in a, in a high-end restaurant. Um, you know, he does elements of molecular gastronomy. He does, you know, and everything is beautifully plated. You know, the whole the, being in his apartment and everything is all part of the whole Pan Im experience. So like a lot of private dining businesses which have that kind of vibe, he's had to retool his offering and come up with food that will travel well. The meals that he, he is selling for takeaway is not as, um, the meals are not as um, elaborate as, as you might have in his home. So it is still multi-course, but it's not going to be quite the same. And um, I have to say that I was really impressed with the food because um, I managed to figure out what would travel well, what would be heat properly, and and then he just went for it. And and the flavors are robust. They are nuanced. They are hot, sour, salty, sweet, which is a hallmark of, of Thai cooking. And he brought all of these elements into into like packed meals in takeout boxes and i remember um i shared the meal with my family and we all fell in love with the rice i mean you you can say that rice is like the the throwaway item right it's just rice but his rice is cooked with coconut milk and it's like the greens are like distinct um there's this wonderful aroma um, and it goes so well with the rest of his food. You know, I mean, hands down, I would rather go eat at his home. But if I can't, if, res if restaurants and private dining businesses cannot reopen, then I think it's the second best that I can live with. Okay, so let's talk more about the food, which may be a bit tricky to review for you because, you know, the menu changes every fortnight. But sure, are there any staples? Because you mentioned rice earlier, right? Or perhaps you could give us an indication of, yeah. of the overall quality and experience mm. that someone can expect from dining uh, mm. with a Pan Im. Okay, so um, if, if I were going to order his food regularly, I really would want to have a different menu each time I do. Not, I don't want to eat the same thing, right? So you can always count on Vincent to do something amazing with beef. There will be a beef course, there will always be a soup. And, um, and you can expect like the main course would be substantial and it will go really well with rice. And there will be a salad of some sort. Um, and you know Thai salads are just so zippy and vibrant. So really, I mean, yes, I had one of those menus, but pretty much if you... And, and the thing is that Vincent's meals are so sought after that you're just really lucky to get a slot. Do you know what I mean? Um, and unless you have like really strong allergies, you know, it, it, it's going to be amazing. So sure, you know, we are very much looking forward to Monday when dining in at restaurants is supposed to, to restart again. So can we get your quick take? Do you think that will happen in a few days' time? I don't think there's a chance that it will happen. From what Lawrence Wong said on Facebook and Instagram yesterday, I just don't see how they're going to let restaurants reopen. So I think you should go book that slot for a pan in meal takeaways are still going to be the norm, at least for the next couple of weeks. 
Oh, very enlightening indeed. Thanks very much, Xue. I've been speaking with food editor Tan Xueyun. With dining in still banned for now, you can order set meals for delivery. In the meantime, go to the owner's Instagram page at Vincent PJY to find out how to order these meals, when to order, and what you can order. Hey, look out for our new Pixar movie tomorrow on Disney+. Plus. If you can't holiday in Italy right now, watching Luca may be the next best thing. Set in an idyllic seaside town on the Italian Riviera, it takes us through an adventure with the main character Luca and his best friend Alberto. And I should mention that both of them are some sort of sea creature. Well, film correspondent John Louis is here with more. So John, an animated movie about sea creatures who transform into humans, it reminds me first of all of The Little Mermaid, but you've compared it with a, a more recent offering from Pixar, 2017's Coco. So how does Luca measure up? Well, The Little Mermaid was more or less a princess story. This is, isn't a princess story. Yeah, the they two people, the two boys in there are sea creatures who come on land. So there's a similarity with Little Mermaid. But it's more like Coco in the sense that they come from a village, multi-general, multi-generational family. It's warm, it's loving, it's filled with good food. And it's also some sort of similar, uh, similar cultural background there. One is Italian, one is Mexican, of course. So what you have there is a very colorful and warm Mediterranean setting. Well, as you know, Pixar films are held to an incredibly high standard. Among other things, they're famous for stories that entertain both kids and adults. Do you think Luca meets these very high expectations? Yes, it does. Um, visually, okay, it's not as lush as Coco. You know, you don't have the big parade scenes. It's a small, intimate setting. And yeah, like I said, it's not a princess story. It's seen through the eyes of two boys who are shape-changing sea creatures and they have an adventure in the town of Porto Rosso. So it's a coming-of-age story. It's a bit of a buddy comedy. One boy is very shy, played by uh, uh, Jacob Tremblay from Room, if you can remember. And the other is Jack Dylan Grazer, who was in It, the, the horror movie. So it's a fun boys' adventure comedy. Well, thanks, John. That's a lovely, light-hearted one to watch this weekend. Luca drops on Disney Plus tomorrow. Well, next up, a new exhibition by Singapore's oldest living pioneer artist, Lim Tzu Peng, who turns 100 years old in September. The showcase, titled Soul of Ink, Lim Tzu Peng at 100, was launched just this week at the Arts House by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Well, joining us is journalist To Wen Lee to tell us more. Welcome back, Wen Lee. Can you elaborate on the cultural significance of Mr. Lim's work and how does that translate into what's included in this exhibition? Yeah, so Mr. Lim Zipeng um, is um, well known as a calligrapher as well as uh, a painter. Um, in, in this particular exhibition, um, we get to see about 20 of his most recent works which completed between last year and this year. So um, one thing that does strike out is how innovative his work continues to be and how he um, how he's so adept at um, at ink um, painting as well as calligraphy, and we do see quite a few um, abstract pieces. Um, for example, um, the, this one abstract work um, taking this one abstract work that depicts lines from this Chinese um, heroic poem Man Jiang Hong, uh, which which kind of um, shows off his abstract style, and a couple of others which which also demonstrate this um, this sense of what he calls Hu Tu Zi, which is muddled calligraphy, um, where the, the words are so abstract. Um, that you can't even make them up. So it's um, that, that's something to look out for. Um, another thing about this exhibition is that the works are very colorful. We see so many splashes of color um, by the artist as he um, heads into his um, hundredth year. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, so well, definitely a show um, that's well with the. Uh, yeah. Well, Wenli, you mentioned already. You know some pieces that we should look out for. What are the other must-see ones? Yeah, there are a couple of, um, I think there are four paintings which were started in the 1980s. Um, and last year, the artist took them out again and he added more colors to them. So they're kind of neon-like, um, brighter hues. 
Um, so, so you do get a sense of, of an artist who is trying to constantly um, push the boundaries and, and you know, um, make things new again in a sense. Um, there also some interest, it's also an um, interesting figurative um, streetscape of a shop house in Crater Aya. And if it's this huge, um, it measures about two meters by 2.4 meters. And you can sort of make out um, dried fish hanging along, alongside undergarments um, outside one of these shop houses. So that the attention to detail, especially since this was so work that was um, painted from memory, is, is quite, um, it's quite interesting. Well, sounds very interesting indeed. Thanks so much, Wen Lee. The exhibition will run until June the 30th at the Arts House. There is a book as well already out at major bookstores. Well, lots more ideas in the Friday pages of tomorrow's paper. And for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Quake. See you tomorrow on The Big Story.